This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. This is why the Nkunguma Pride is such a firm favourite. It's Kinky Tail. He just looks ready for a fight. This is still her territory. Mm. The Avoca boys are here to stay. Ooh. How insane was that? Good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome to Monday's Safari Lives. Can you believe it is Monday once again? I certainly can't. My name is Jamie, and behind the camera is Darby, fresh-faced and back from leave. And, of course, this episode of Safari Lives now numbers somewhere around 47 or 48. I actually can't really remember. But it doesn't matter because, of course, Safari Lives, we have a friend who's joined us here. This side striped skink, or striped skink, sorry, is really looking forward to hearing all about what a Safari Lives is truly about. And what Safari Lives is about is a wrap up of the week and our experiences and what we've seen our various animal characters get up to. It's a great way for people to keep track of what they've been doing, keep track of what we've been doing, and to follow along and basically summarize the stories. Because, of course, the bush out here is full of stories. Where is out here? Out here by, I think we, I think the sheer thought of the magnitude of the, this whole thing has scared it away. We're coming to you live from a place called Juma Private Game Reserve, which is in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. Remember that you can send us through your questions and you can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So, I am sitting surrounded by a circle of bones. Um, both of the bones and myself, very bony. I made the comment for you just so that you can't. Uh, we've really done skulls to death. We've spoken about leg bones. We've spoken about skulls. We've spoken about teeth. We've spoken about all sorts of things. And I love that because I have an absolute fascination with the way in which animals work. So today, what we're going to do is take a look inside our characters and don't worry there is a dissection involved but it's not one of your known and loved animals I promise and we'll talk a little bit about that in just a little while but today's subject is going to be anatomy and function and the way that animals work it's a topic that is very close to my heart you know which sits sort of in the middle of the sternum just slightly off to the left but not very much that's the anatomy of the heart. It's a subject that sits very close to my heart and, of course, in my brain as well. We've done, I've done quite a lot of research into the different ways that the animals work, and we're going to be talking about all of the different animals that we see and how their anatomy comes together to make them into the creature that they are. So I hope you're all very excited about that. I'll explain a little bit more in a bit, but of course it's not just me nattering on and wanting to cut things up like some sort of mad biologist. Rusty is out and about looking for wild animals. Let's go across to him. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This is another week of Safari Lives. We're going to catch up with some of your characters, some of our characters, some of our favorite characters. Not us, the animals. We're not that great. Senzor is. Senzor's a cameraman today for me and hi, I'm Rusty for those who don't know. And yes, Jamie definitely has her hands full today. It's going to be very interesting. I do wish I was in the tent and seeing what she gets up to. It's going to be an interesting one. So my plan this afternoon is finding those spotted cats or oh, that's every day for me uh yeah well anything that comes in between us and them well that is good to see them too there's we just passed a whole bunch of elephant tracks crossing the road heading that direction <laughs> and we are going to try to get around but we did see one of the bulls at lunchtime when we went for an insane insane run it's completely different to yesterday or this morning when we got up where I was looked like the Michelin man. All of us looked like we had but far too many layers of clothes on, but that was just 
how we looked with the, how cold it was. But now Senzo, you could hardly recognize Senzo when he's cold, but now he's sitting there with a vest and shorts. It's <laughs> yin and yang here. <laughs> so it's, yeah, we're two different people <laughs> from morning to evening, but it has been a gorgeous day. And even if it stays quiet with our characters, we are, it's just amazing being out here and being able to share this with you. Oh, thank you. You're wishing me a good luck. Thank you very much. I think I have that luck. I don't think I need it, but no, that's a joke. I definitely, I wish some, yeah, I do need some luck in finding leopards, but anything else is just a bonus. The cats have been a bit shy recently. We think, yeah, I just, I don't want to say it, but yeah, we think that Tandy might be on a kill somewhere because she has not been seen or seen her tracks. She's normally, her tracks are somewhere around camp or there's some movement of her most days that she's been very quiet so we think she's parked up somewhere on a kill and yeah to lamba i have to pronounce it better these days um she hasn't been seen two days i know of but these will pop up whenever and same with tagana the two leopards so we will see. So while we keep looking around, let's go over to James to say good afternoon. Hello everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to this end of the Sunset Safari Live my name is James Henry. On camera today we have got Craig, that's his very fast Batman-like thumb, and our characters for the afternoon are the hyenas of the Juma clan. Uh, also, what are my other characters today? The Evoker males, unfortunately we probably won't see them because they're not here, and the Unkahumas of course, uh, who are now on Bofotsuk, which is the reserve to the north of us. So our plan is going to be to check out what's going on with the... Sorry, the game drive radio is going off in my head. What's going on with the hyena dens? I'm not sure there'll be anything there at this time of the day. So we'll have a quick look now, then we'll go back there a bit later. Otherwise, we'll see what else we can find in and around this area. Treehouse Dam, which is the sort of central waterhole of the area. And that's the general plan. So please send us your questions as I'm sure the other two have told you, and make them character-based if you can, or certainly based on what Jamie's doing in the tent. I'm slightly disappointed to be driving today, and that's not because I am uh, not enjoying driving, it's because I was really quite excited to see what Jamie's going to be doing in the tent. I think it's going to be fascinating. There is a young kudu bull. in the background, you might just be able to make out the sound of a lilac blistered roller. No, it's not a lilac blistered roller, in fact, it's a squirrel shouting at something. I've become very untrusting of squirrels. What's our first animal? A young kudu. It's better than I've done the last few drives. We've had, I think, the first mammal in about an hour and a half into the drive. Let us continue. There's another q do in there, but I can just see one stripe through the bushes. So I shall leave that. Oh, there's some giraffe tracks. That's quite fun. Not very common about here, or giraffes. It's a giraffe and not a beefalo, yes, it is a giraffe. So we'll go around about to the top of Philemon's dip through that den and down to the different dens that they're at at the moment. And while we do that, we'll let us go back to the tent to Dr. Patterson and uh, her, well, cutting.
has a really lovely ring to it, doesn't it? I think I'll um, I'll settle for that as a nickname. It's definitely allowed to call yourself a doctor as a nickname. <coughs> I mentioned that I have a fascination with animal anatomy and biology. The next section could go horribly, horribly wrong, in which case I do sincerely apologize. It's been a long time since I have dissected something. First, before we get into the the... <coughs> the realities of what I'm going to show you. First of all, we're going to talk a little bit about scrub hairs. And the reason that we're going to talk about scrub hairs is because they are ubiquitous at the moment. We've been doing a lot of working in the dark, and as a result, and for some reason, this place is absolutely bursting with scrub hair. There's scrub hair. I cannot tell you how many we drive past in a night. We stop for the little babies and if it's near the side of the road, but I probably see on average close to 50 scrub hair each and every single time I'm out on drive in the dark. Nocturnal animals, obviously, and very, very interesting, and I'll show you why. So first of all, what we're going to do, and I'm going to use my mouse over here, is we're going to have a look at a scrub hair anatomy. And what I want to point out here is those enormous ears sticking out over the top of its head as well as some enormous eyes and the very thick fur and the rather rodent-like approach to chewing. We've included a section here with our thermal camera because it's added such a massive element to our understanding of how it is that these creatures work. It really is utterly fascinating what you'll notice is the glow of the scrub hair's ears. Now what we're doing now, and I think the clip is now done, should be done, is we are going to put our gloves on and we are going to have a look at a dead scrub hair. I should just quickly tell you that the way in which the scrub hair died is not a mystery. It's very unfortunate though. It was human, it was as a result of human beings. It was, it's roadkill. It was killed by presumably quite a fast moving vehicle on one of the main roads, not by one of us. And the poor thing is now very deceased. It's also a little bit cold because it's been living in the freezer for the last three days. Now this is our scrub hair over here. Darby, which side would you like me to stand? I think that side. Cool. And I just don't want to get my shadow too much on her head. Now we're pretty certain that it's a female. And the reason that we're pretty certain that it's a female is because we think that we can see her nipples here. <laughs> Julie says that she loves anatomy and that she still has all of her books from college. That's awesome, Julie. So this is obviously, for some people, it's a little bit disturbing. I've been ably assisted here by Koli, who has very kindly offered to give up his afternoon off in order to be an assistant to a mad scientist. He's already cut away most of the fur on the belly. But what we want to talk about first, before we get into the belly, is the massive ears. Now you saw how those ears, there are lots of ticks in here, for a start, lots of the small species of ticks. There we go, there they are there. A little bit um, misplaced now. But what we want to talk about is the reason that scrub bears have such large ears. Now the first reason is pretty obvious. I mean, they it's for listening. Oh, there's a lot more ticks in here. Oh, she's so, shame she's so stiff. There we go, a lot more ticks in there. Now the reason is, of course, they can hear, much like a kudu's ears, so they help to funnel the sound into the ear canal. But there's another reason that is particularly relevant in the sort of wilds of South Africa, and that is because they are fantastic thermoregulators. So you saw how hot those ears were. The skin is really, really thin, really, really, really thin through here and that allows the blood to go very close to the surface and obviously then cool down rather than being covered by this thick layer of fur which is particularly relevant for a, an animal like this that lives out here. Jimmy says he, can't, he didn't realize how large scrub hairs are. They're actually really large. Listen, I'm sorry if this does disturb you. There, it will not be the whole of this afternoon's show will, be, will not be spent with this poor deceased scrub hair. She's donated her body to science. Yes, they've, they're actually quite long. I mean, that is probably close on 
75 centimeters from the tips of her toes. But what I also want to show you, just quickly while we're talking about it, a lot of people think that scrub hairs are rodents. They're not. They belong to the order Legomorph. I'm just going to flip her over here, Dov, and I'm going to show you her mouth. Shame. I accidentally dropped her face first in the sand earlier, so that's why she's got sand. So they people looked at their teeth and sort of assumed that this was a very rodent-like set up with these two incisors on the top and the bottom but as it happens they actually have and I'll see if I can open her mouth she's rigor mortis is obviously set in uh, it's very difficult mm, but she's actually got four incisors there's a second set at the back there I've also recently discovered that in hairs one of the plates of their skulls does not fuse so it or hasn't fused so it's almost like a joint in their skull now i can't figure out where it is through feeling and i can't find out i've googled it and i can't find out where it is but apparently it's to act as a shock absorber so somewhere in here is a plate of the skull that hasn't actually fused which i find fascinating and i didn't know what we are going to do and i'm probably not going to do it right now I'm going to give you a little bit of time to prepare is I'm going to cut open her belly and what we're looking for in particular is we always talk about how certain types of animals are hind gut fermenters hares are as well even though they practice coprophagy they eat their own dung pellets I want to show you what the cecum looks like of a hind gut fermenter if I can find the cecum I've never dissected a scrub hair it's been a long time since I've dissected anything actually and I have to just say thank you to Trishala for providing me with her dissection kit because that's going to help immensely so we're going to actually cut her open and we're going to look for the cecum in particular but the arrangement of body organs as well and the reason we're going to do that is every mammal out here follows a formula there's a femur, there's a tibia, there's a fibula, there's phalanges and carpals, metacarpals, tarsals, and all of those sorts of things. So the formula, the basic formula, whether we're talking about a scrub rabbit or scrub hare, or whether we're talking about hyenas, is essentially the same. All right, so speaking of hyenas, we're certainly not going to be cutting any of them up. James has arrived at the den. Let's see if anybody's home. I'm very glad we won't be cutting up any hyenas' pyjamas. I think that would result in definite internet breakage. Obviously, Jamie is doing some very interesting science there in the tent. And I know some of you will probably be slightly put off by the goriness of it. But I think if you can stomach it, it's going to be very fascinating indeed. So here we are at the den to the south of the Philemon's Cutline den. It's not... It's sometimes active, and then there's another one that's sometimes active as well, quite close by. That's June and her two youngsters over there. And it's a long time since I've seen Plonk and Pretty's youngsters, and Pretty and Ribbon and all the others, and I don't know if they've been around here or if they've been at the other den. But we'll check both. Quite lucky, really, that we've had them out here at all. I'm quite surprised. Everything is very quiet and very calm at the moment. Alrighty, now what I did say was that they're using multiple dens at the moment. And um, we're going to show you, well, we've got two hyena clips this afternoon. I'm just not sure exactly which one we're going to show you now. So I'm just going to ask Faith to tell me again so that I can tell you because I'm slightly confused by both of them. Is this the one with Plonk in it, Faith? No, that doesn't... Oh, right, okay, so this is, right, right, okay, I got it. I got it, I am with it. Okay, so, Sunday was Mother's Day, of course. June is a mother, this is her. This clip features June and a ribbon at this very den. 
Dawn is oft best spent at the den, with the light is soft, the cubs are playful, and the adults are often around for a visit. I say den, but these days it's actually more like a warren. With seven cubs to house, the clan is now occupying two or three spots. The salubrious larger dens of yesteryear for some reason rejected. The hierarchy is constantly enforced, although Ribbon needed little reminding of her lowly station. June's little ones continue to thrive, and their mother is tireless in her care. That said, a spa day for a busy mother in the lead up to Mother's Day weekend is always welcome. Well, that was a very fascinating kind of day we had with them. Uh, I have been, I think, singularly unsuccessful at finding all of the different hyenas. And so we will show you a little bit later some of the other characters of the Juma clan because we've had a pretty good week of seeing them this week. So it's been really nice. I don't think we're going to go anywhere from here. I think we're going to stay here and just see if they don't start to play. Then we might check the other den and see if the others are out over there as well, which I think will be quite fun. And for those of you who were watching this morning, Crawley turned to the camera to say something or other about the hyenas, and he had his foot on the running board, just sort of half out of the car. And Plonk came right up to him and gave him a little nip on the foot. And Paulie let out a very unmanly squeal, which was quite amusing, uh, but also just an indication of how precocious Plonk has become. Or well, not has become, is in general. And these two much better mannered, of course, and that's because they don't have the same status and therefore the same confidence that the matriarch's son has got. It's a glorious afternoon. A hyena doing precisely what any sensible organism in this area is doing right now, finding a beautiful patch of winterish sun and just lying in it loving the feeling of the low-felt winter because at this time of the day it really is very special it's a good sort of 26 degrees celsius or so i suppose which is about 78 degrees fahrenheit and that's quite pleasant very still no breeze it'll get a little bit colder later on uh, for the little ones well they can just go inside the den I felt, Jim, you're wondering if the adult hyena knows I'm here. Well, if it doesn't, it's got a severe head injury or it's gone blind uh, so um, and deaf. And, in fact, uh, its nose has stopped functioning. It can definitely tell that we're here. June was born in June 2015. That's why she gets her name, or that's where she gets her name from. She's known us from the time she was born and is completely comfortable with vehicles. And what's interesting is that the cubs show a huge amount of curiosity. And when they turn about, I'm gonna say six to eight months, they lose that curiosity with the vehicles and they start to ignore us exactly as June is doing now. Her cubs, when they're finished feeding, might come and investigate the vehicle. And I think you'll find the closer to the top of the hierarchy the cubs are, the more precocious they are around the vehicles until they hit, start to hit puberty and then they just lose interest completely. So you'll never have an adult hyena coming up to the vehicle to have a real kind of sniff around and pinch the oil caps off the wheels or bite cameras off the front, as happened to Jamie a few times in the Mara. The adults just kind of ignore you. But they're not afraid of us at all. They don't see us as a threat and they don't see us as a threat to their cubs. Interestingly, however, they're not as tolerant of us off-road as, say, a leopard is. They won't. They will allow you to follow them, but only at a distance. You can't get up right close like you can with a leopard. Which I always find quite strange, because, of course, they're much less private than leopards. Alrighty, let's go across to the western parts of the reserve where Rustles is looking for leopards and we might move on to the other den. Oh, 
Oh, those hyenas must be cute, all bundled up and suckling right now. It's quite a, it's quite a picture. I did, uh, for those who were watching this morning, did you see those hyenas that um, <laughs> bit poorly on the foot? Oh, he lucky he had a shoe on, and I believe it was Plonk who got attached to his shoe. So, we are still, we did still a loop around. We found one track of a leopard, and it was, we think, Tingana, but it looks like it came in and disappeared into one of the blocks. We did a loop right around, but still nothing. So maybe later he might make a move and come out the block. He might have already come out the block last night. I just can't find the track or later, early on today. So we are coming back to where I said I saw the elephant tracks crossing over to the left-hand side here. So we're going to do another loop and see if they're going down to the watering hole or towards the dam cam. Uh, uh, yeah. Nothing fresh yet. I am still keen on finding Tlamba. She's been a bit of a shy cat at the moment. She's probably tucked away with her mum laughing at us. It's like, Haha, we've had a break from you for a few days. But talking about Tlamba, I think we should see what she's been up to this last week. Ian, whoa. sorry, almost missed the road asking it wanting. Ian, you're asking how many times uh, in a lifetime can a leopard produce cubs? Well, they a full, um, this a female leopard comes into maturity at about two, two and a half years. She can fall pregnant then. And then let's say, yeah, up to about 13, 14, 13 years of age, they, that's pushing it. Like Tandi, one of our, our characters for today, she is, she, we believe she just had a, lot, a litter, but that could, she's an age where she's 13 years old and she is pushing a, a very old leopard age. So she can get a few more years older, but whether or not she'll have cubs. So you're looking at from two and a half years, she, they can fall pregnant. And then what, every two years, a year and a half, they can fall pregnant again. So, yeah, let's go, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe six litters in a lifetime, on average, maybe even less than that. And then you got, yeah, it's two, three cubs at a time, maybe one cub surviving. Ooh. We've got a lot of elephant tracks crossing here. I think it's the same herd we saw earlier. Yep, it's the same herd that came across. I don't know if you could see them on the road there. That's a herd of Ellie's that crossed here. Now it's all over on top of all the vehicle tracks. So I wonder if they've already crossed over our boundary. I would like to see them. Okay, well, let's keep going. It's all mums and calves and definitely a young bull in there somewhere. So, while we go find these elephants, I think we should go and look at what Tlamba has been up to this week. Tlamba continues to grow in independence, spending most of her time in solitude away from her mother, Queen Tandi. The young princess made her way through the thickets, seemingly on a mission to find breakfast. Gaining advantage on a termite mound, she scanned her surroundings surveying keenly before half-heartedly calling for her mother. With no response from mum and no prospects for breakfast, a groom was in order before the young princess disappeared into the thicket. Wouldn't it be nice to come around the corner and she'll be lying on the road. She is definitely one of my favorite leopards and one of the first ones I actually got to meet when arriving here. But she has grown up just in the few weeks I have met her. She made her first kill while I was here. I did not witness it, but I did 
Uh, I did see the live footage of it. And then her killing the her first male, full-grown male Impala that we know of, and then the second one. And then it's just that, oh, then she killed a young Kuda calf. It was absolutely brilliant. She's doing very, very well. So, while we're still on the move here, shall we go see what Jamie has been up to in the tent? Okay, this is going to be the goriest part of this whole process. So, um, you know, for those of you that are sensitive of stomach, please don't watch. Just turn away for a little bit. Just listen if you want to. If you don't, a um, cup of tea might be nice uh, because we are going to... I've cut, her, I've cut her belly open, or his actually. I think it's a he. So I want to show you what the intestines of a scrub hair look like because every single herbivore is basically geared towards breaking down plant material and getting the most out of it that they can all right you ready prepare yourselves okay cool so before i started cutting through the connective tissue what i wanted to show you was the amount of blood vessels it's obviously still stomach contents of his last meal the amount of blood vessels that move through or cover the intestines and fill up the peritoneal cavity which obviously are very important for a couple of things. One is to keep the cells supplied with blood, but the other, of course, is for absorption as well. Uh, we all pretty much know the process. We go through the small intestine to the large intestine, but things get a little bit different in a hindgut fermenter. This here is a massively modified part of the intestine that is the cecum, and the cecum <clears throat> is essentially a fermenting chamber filled with bacteria, good bacteria, not bad bacteria, that help to break down the plant material and actually allow the body to get as much as possible because the digestive system is not capable of breaking down cellulose. So that is where all of the important stuff happens, not all of the digestive products make it through the cecum, some actually bypass it, and then as you get towards the end, you get little calcics. Yes, I tell you exactly what its last meal was. It was grass, because <laughs> that's what they eat. Um, calcics wants to know if I can tell from the digestive tract. I can't. Where are the little pellets gone? Oh, yeah. There we go. The end, the end part of the digestive process, as you know. I'm going to cut open the intestine. Sorry, Dar, for the smell. Uh, Sculpt's a little blunt. Here we go. And that is the little dropping that we find at the end product of the digestion. Not fully formed yet, but there you go. It was grass. Plant material. And as you know, they practice coprophagy. Get off my finger, please. And so as a result, they're able to <laughs> they're able to digest their food properly. There you go. I mean, no, this is gruesome, but it's really fascinating. Look at the massive muscle structures along the inside of the abdominals, lining the spine, and huge blood vessels that transport blood to the lower limbs and to the pelvis, and of course, then return the blood back to the heart and then to the lungs, which is utterly fascinating. I think this is a spleen, well, I'm not 100% sure. I'm missing a liver somewhere, so this might be liver. This could, no, there's liver there. That's its liver. No, it's a kidney, that's a kidney. Sorry, talking nonsense. Look, there's one kidney, there's the other kidney. Sundancer imagery says that they love learning about this stuff. I do too, I find it totally fascinating. And it doesn't in any way stress me out or disgust me, I'm lucky that way. It doesn't bother me. It's lungs. I haven't broken into the chest cavity yet. It's a bit of a tricky one to do, but there's lobes of lungs in here. Now, this whole thing. It's fascinating to me to think that this is a meat sack. It's a sack of meat that exists, as all of us do, purely to keep the neurons and the brain alive. Your whole body is just your brain and your eyes, your neurons, your what am I trying to say? Your nerve structure, your nerve system, everything else exists to keep your brain alive. All of this 
exists to keep your brain alive, and I find that absolutely fascinating. Our Lara Moore wants to know if the diaphragm was visible. To be honest, when I pulled out, I was actually thinking about that. When I pulled out the, the intestines, I was looking for it, but I didn't actually see it all that clearly. Perhaps I'm talking nonsense. Perhaps that's because this is the liver and I haven't actually got into the lungs. There's the diaphragm. Our Lara Moore, that's the diaphragm here. This bit here. This entire layer is the diaphragm and I actually haven't got in to the lungs. I thought I'd cut something by mistake but I haven't. This is the liver, there's the stomach here and this is the diaphragm and its lungs and its heart are here so separated from the rest of the abdominal cavity. I thought I'd somehow made this tragic error of cutting through the diagram. I couldn't quite work out how I'd done that but I haven't. This is fascinating. I'm going to try and get into the heart and the lungs and then we're done, I think, with this uh, scrub here. Oh, by the way, why I think it's a male, those little things I said were nipples, I found um, testes. These are testes. Yes, Zach, absolutely, I would not be surprised at all if we have a visit from a hyena later today um, or later this evening as it gets dark. Yes, they'll smell. They will definitely smell what we're doing. Oh, so tough. It's astounding how much force you need to cut through meat. Here we go, into the chest. Here we go. Here's the heart and the lungs. Isn't that fascinating? So clean. Obviously there's no blood because there's no circulation here happening. Isn't this absolutely fascinating? So what we're going to do, speaking of predators, is once we're finished with her, I just need to cut through this bit here, Darth. What we need to do is we are going to put her out to feed the predators after we're done here. So she will become a meal for another creature. Let's see if I can get the lung out. There we go. The lobes of the lung. Very cool. I'm absolutely loving this. It's so fascinating. Big thank you to Koli. There are very few people who shine as brightly as he does in this ever dull world. So thank you to him for playing assistant. Right, I'm going to try and finish this up now. So while I do that, we'll send you across to James with an animal that would absolutely love to be here. So here we are at the other den, everybody, and we've just, you've arrived just at the right time. You're seeing precisely the interaction that you saw a little bit earlier between June and Ribbon. So that's Ribbon and June. Ribbon was lying peacefully, quietly lying on the ground, and then June arrived as you came over here and just basically disturbed her, dominated her, and pushed her off the back seat of the bus. Do you know what I mean by that? You know when some youngster is sitting on the back seat of a bus and the older kids get into the bus and decide that they need to move for no other reason that they need to move. And that's what's just happened here. But what's interesting is that she's now looking down into the den, which I don't really understand why she would do that, given that her cubs have not come with her. I'm just gonna, am I gonna back up? I am gonna back up slightly. I don't know where Ribbon's gone. You see what I mean by the fact that they're moving around these dens? Where's poor old Ribbon gone? She was sleeping so peacefully. I think that's June now, gone to sleep without her kids. not a great place to park. Um, have you got her there, Craig? I don't want to drive up onto the mound here, simply because it's not really fair if the youngsters come out. Not that they're vaguely afraid of vehicles. So 
say when you got a shot there, Kriegers? Bit more? Yeah? Okay. Then I, I do believe animals can recognize our scent and voice. I've no doubt in my mind. Remember that stat I gave you the other day of a rat versus a human being. 80% of a rat's brain is dedicated to interpreting olfactory signals, whereas 3% of a human being's brain is dedicated to the same. I think you'll probably find a hyena is much closer to a rat than it is to a human, which means that uh, the smell of a human being and the different smells that human beings have must be familiar to them. The only thing that I would say counteracts that is the overpowering smell of these vehicles. So they smell like petrol, or what you'd call gasoline there in the United States, steering fluid and brake fluid and coolant and engine oil and carbon monoxide, and all, well, carbon monoxide's odorless, but all of the other gases that the car produces. Uh, so I think that's probably the overwhelming smell here. And I think that's often also why we're able to approach animals as close as we are able to in these vehicles because they mark, mask our human scent. So, yes, I'm sure they can smell the vehicles. Can they smell the individual humans in them? Uh, I don't know. Can they recognize our voices? I really can't see how that wouldn't be possible, except to say the following. They can definitely recognize each other's voices. Of that, we have no doubt. There's plenty of research to show that just about all animals can recognize different individuals of their own species. But in the same way that I can't recognize the difference between two hyena sounds unless I heard them repeatedly, I don't know if we sound all the same to human beings. I mean, I seriously doubt I sound the same as Lauren or as Jamie to these hyenas but I could easily sound the same as Koli does. Um, obviously, to you, we sound completely different because our accents are totally different, but the tones of our voice is pretty similar, I guess, and I guess if your ears are not attuned to it, you might think that that was the same creature speaking. So, yeah, I, I think it makes a big difference to them. I've often thought that elephants can recognize individual voices and certainly the tone in individual voices, and then there is always the chance that you are engaging in some sort of conf confirmation bias. So, for example, we love to think that the leopards recognize us individually. I've fallen prey to this many, many times, where I was convinced that Horsana was recognizing my voice and coming towards the vehicle because he heard me speaking my unique timbre. And uh, I... Whether that's true or not, I really don't know. I think it's unlikely, but it's possible. The problem out here, especially as guides and as casual observers as we all are, is that many of our observations tend to lack scientific rigor. Uh, they are wild conjecture, half of which makes it so much fun. Minamu, yes, hyenas do use multiple dens to avoid predators, but at the moment they're using two dens right next to each other, and they don't seem to be staying in the same place all the time. So June's here now, her cubs are at the other den. The last time I saw her, she was at this den with her two cubs, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Pretty was here, uh, Ribbon was here too. So they seem to be all over the place, and I don't know at which den Plonk was at this morning. So I'm not really sure. So, uh, I mean, to answer your question properly, yes, they do move dens because of predators sometimes. So if there's pressure on the den, they'll move. Uh, sometimes it's for disease. And sometimes it's because of flooding, for example. That can happen in a place like the Mara. Not so much here. In fact, the chances of flooding here are uh, extremely, extremely small. Same as the chances of a politician apologizing. And so, you know, I don't, I think that they are operating from two dens here because both of the dens are small and they're too small to take all seven of the cubs. Okay, let's go back across to Rustles, who I believe has not found his character, but he has found something interesting. <laughs> it's not.
not my character, but he's really cute. Now he was digging in a pile of quite fresh rhino dung, and he was eating what little beetles or larvae or whatever is in that pile of dung on the road. I am not too sure what is in there, but it was enjoying it for the short time we had it. At this time of the year, when it gets dry and dry, there's less dung beetles and less insects in general that will be in the pile of dung. But he found it. I think it's actually termites he was looking for because he was almost waist deep in that pile of poo. And he was he found a few morsels. So he disappeared off to, fa to follow up on his family members. You can, all, you can hear them in the background chirping to each other. Let's go around this. So I did find where the elephants went out of the area. <laughs> but the tracks headed straight out. And I think they might have been harassed by a bull because they're not even they weren't walking very slowly. They were you could see where their track is where the back foot is way ahead of the front foot. So I think they might have been I think one of the cows might be in season and I think the one or two bulls might be harassing them or a bull might be in must and is following them and just pushing them. So it's fair enough for them to get out the way. They don't need that. Um, it's definitely that time of day where you get the golden light coming through everything here. Now all we need is Tundi or Flamba laid out on an anthill with the golden light on their faces. <gasps> Am I wishing for a bit, mu bit much? No, I don't think so. It does happen. You do come around the corner and it's a voila, presented to you on a platter. So, we're still browsing around, see if anyone is moving about. But while we do that, should we go back to James and see what the hyenas are getting up to? Hello everybody, back again we are. Uh, June has not moved. Her bullied friend has disappeared somewhere else. Not sure where she's gone. So we were chatting a little bit about the den sites and the fact that they seem to be using both dens because they're not big enough uh, to house everybody. And what I was thinking the other day is that the... Well, and you'll see in this next little clip that we're going to play for you is that the old Juma clan dens seem to be much bigger, you know, if you think about the, for those of you who are uh, sort of veterans of safari life, you think about the dens or from Vuba Road or off Gallego Shortcut, which are much further to the north of where we are now. They were much bigger than these huge, air, you know, places with multiple entrances and they haven't seemed to use a termite mound of that size for some time. Anyway, I think the number of cubs and the size of the mounds has meant that they need to move between the two. They're very close to each other. They're not far at all, only about 100 metres or so. All righty, so I wasn't sure if we had... <laughs> I wasn't sure if we would, had cued that clip or not. So what we'll do is now have a look at a very complicated kind of clip of what was going on around these den sites during the course of the week. Now, please try and keep up with what's going on because it's really quite difficult and it took me quite a long time and a bit of help from Jamie to figure out exactly what was going on. A lot going on at the dens this week, so hold on to your seats and try to keep up. Plonk made a welcome reappearance a few evenings ago. He's barely recognisable as the little cub of the matriarch and is now a rather presumptuous juvenile with a taste for the exotic, in this case a dwarf mongoose. His exalted status continues to make him less than gracious to his clanmates, his mother included. That said, Corky remains protective of her darling chasing Pretty's cubs away when they got a little rough. And Tima, a low ranker, received little respect and so chose to take her frustrations out on a stick. 
before receiving a little bit more attention from Pretty's son. Then it was the turn of the matriarch to assert herself with her two ICs babies. Finally, Antima disappeared past Pretty snoozing in the dark. So I don't know about you, but when I first watched that clip, I had to close it again and go and have a small lie down because it took me that long to figure out what was happening. And it, it, very interesting because we had just about all the characters in there. We had Antima in there, we had Plonk in there, we had Corky, we had Pretty, we had... Why did Ribbon make an appearance in that clip? I don't think she did. Uh, June seemed to make an appearance, but then I don't think... Yes, she did. She did make an appearance right at the very end. So we had lots of them. And that's both between these two dens over here. So, um, what was I going to say now of vital importance? It was about Plonk, really. And I thought that Plonk kind of looks like a privileged trust fund kid um, who... Well, maybe not, actually. That's the wrong way to describe him. He looks like the son of the chief gangster. What do you call a chief gangster, Craig? I don't know what you call the chief gangster. I'm not sure there's a word for the chief gangster. I suppose you call him the godfather, but you wouldn't call Corky the godmother, would you? Just kind of arrogant, and he's overconfident, and has got a kind of... Uh, real swagger about him, especially if you happen to be Crawley's boot. I suppose you might call her the Don or the Don's son. I say, oh, but gangsterish, these chaps. That, of course, is going to change for Plonk irrevocably because, of course, the poor fellow is going to have to leave this clan if he ever wants to mate. And so he will be enjoying his days of dominance for now, but as the hormones of puberty eventually kick in, he's going to get a wanderlust, and then he's eventually going to leave and go off and live with another clan as a low-ranking member, which is, of course, the way of things with hyenas. I'd be fascinated to know also the kind of hormonal changes that make that happen, because I don't really understand them at all. I've no idea what goes on inside a male hyena's body that makes it want to leave home and seek out the adventure and extreme danger of trying to infiltrate and get into another clan. They're not the only animals that do that, of course. It happens in baboons, entirely common. This is precisely how baboons disperse. It happens in vervet monkeys, same thing. And it happens even in elephants, except the elephants don't go and join another herd. They just leave the clan. And interestingly, it doesn't happen in human beings that commonly. It's more common in traditional societies for women to leave home and go and live with the man's family, which is quite fascinating, I think. Let's go back to the tent now, where Jamie has sharpened her scalpel sufficiently to give you another segment. Okay. This is going to be just a last, last little segment because I'm finding this so fascinating, and I drew so many diagrams to show you this afternoon and it took me all weekend so at some point I'm going to have to stop with the scrub hair but I'm just having so much fun so all I wanted to show you was the organs which I've separated I've disorganized it it's now a disorganized scrub hair apart from the intestines which I've left largely as is because they smell now this here is its lungs so I've cut away all of the blood vessels, but what you'll immediately notice and what we know, remember the formula is the same, two lobes and three lobes. And I always find asymmetry fascinating in nature because of course symmetry, at least in a sort of, ca for casual observation, symmetry is basically the norm. And in this case, as with all mammal lungs, I think, I think it's all mammal lungs, three lobes here, on one side and two lobes here. Eric, you want to know how the smell is? I'm just holding the chest cavity closed because I cut off the heart, so it's, she's a bit bloody inside, or he is a bit bloody inside. Eric wants to know how the smell is. Oh, it's fine. It really is. I mean, it's far worse sitting next to a buffalo kill that has been there for days and days and days and is full of maggots. It really is absolutely fine. 
This is the most nutritious part of the scrub hair, it's the liver and the lobes. Um, liver very, very rich. It actually, those of you who cook liver or eat liver, you'll see it looks pretty much exactly the same. And when the predators eat, that is what they're aiming for. Now just think how a leopard would devour an entire scrub hair like this, including the intestines. They don't sh sort of shrink away. And that's basically what this scrub hair smells like. It's a little bit meaty and um, like stomach contents. This is its little heart tiny 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 little heart obviously doing all of the hard work of pumping blood throughout the entire body and you can see the large opening there to feed the blood back into the ventricles and down into the into the what is it called atrium <laughs> no first atrium then ventricles atrium on top ventricles at the bottom it's been a really long time since i've done this so that's its tiny heart, unbelievably muscular. Oh, whoops. <laughs> it's, it's like it jumped away from me. A very, very muscular. It's so springy and strong. And then the kidneys, which are separated as well for you. Sorry about the last heart. It's a little bit macabre. There you go, that's a kidney. Looks just like a kidney bean. <laughs> I didn't break the scrub hair's heart. I promise. It wasn't me. I did throw it across the the table though, which is just as bad. So two perfectly matched little kidneys, one higher, one lower. And I can only assume this is the pancreas or the spleen. I can't work quite, quite work out what that is. Sorry guys, it's got a little bit bloody, but that's all part and parcel of this process. I think we managed to keep things relatively clean up until now. Joy of black gloves, don't even ask. But the joy of black gloves. You can't actually see it too badly. Cool! So that's the disorganized scrub hair. Look at that. And connective tissue. That's the disorganized scrub hair. I'm actually going to pop her organs back into her abdominal cavity. And I'm going to clean her up and then I'm going to get down to the this the slightly less gory stuff so that those of you who don't like this can return to watching. While I do that and while we just sort this out very quickly, off you pop across to Rusty. I am wondering if they're going to bring this topic up at supper tonight or <laughs> exactly what is exact what is exactly for supper. Scrub hair Yes, I have tried scrub hair before, but something that's been frozen, cut up and dissected, I don't think I'm that interested. It doesn't matter how much I like scrub hair. That is, yeah, no, I just hope, yeah, let's hope they will scrub up nicely and are presented at supper tonight with nothing attached to their fingers. But that is absolutely fascinating and we will, I'll definitely be, myself and Senzo will be watching it this, later on this evening. So, I was just... Just watching all that elephant herd, that, the, the tracks across the road, and talking about family kinship and all that. They, it's lucky for like young elephants that they grow up with the herd, especially the females. They don't really have to leave the herd. They can stay with their mothers and get taught and learn behavior. And they're not just sent off on their own, just do their own thing and say, yeah, we'll have you for a year and a half now, be free, you're on your own. We'll teach you everything you know. And so lucky like with big prides, like lions, the females can stay with the pride, mostly, for most of the time. And they don't have to be, everything is just taught to them. They're where they go, the best places to eat during the winter, where to go for water in the dry times. Same with the elephants, same with lions, same with a lot of the impalas and buffalo. But then you go down to leopards. After just a year and a half, it's like, be free. <laughs> you are on your own, defend for yourself. You know my territories? You know what I smell like, you know what I, how I call, you know what your dad sounds like. Your dad knows you, so you should be fine. It's just, young leopards definitely do have it very hard and the fight for our territory, it becomes very difficult. I'm not saying for male young lions also have it very difficult, but leopards, male or female, they do have a tough time out there. And once it's very hard for them to establish territories, especially when there's such a heavy population. Mina Moo, you're asking 
why can't leopardesses raise a long, young successfully? Some of them. It's not always the case. Some of them are very successful. Tandy's been very good. Some leopards, yeah, it's just bad luck. It's just sometimes you're just in the wrong place, wrong time. Sadly, we heard about Chudulu and her one cub. She lost that to another territorial female. And it's just, it's tough. It's really tough out there. And it's, you learn. Hopefully that other younger cub, that sibling, learns this and watches out now, knows when to run. <laughs> Who to say, yeah, don't hang around and chat to your neighbor. Because it's just, it's just a very tough life out there for leopards. And um, talking about Salamba, she, she's done very, very well for herself. Her mum, although she's very grumpy most of the time, I'm sure she's very proud of her daughter, whether the, <laughs> she does have a funny way of showing it sometimes. Uh, but Tulamba has definitely got her mother's traits and her dad traits. And having that, there was a, a viewing of them a few weeks ago when you had both Tangana, Tandi and Tulamba all together. And that's just a very surprising to see, even at those ages. And Tangana was absolutely chilled with her around. So, yeah, Tulamba's definitely done very well for herself. And at 18 months old, she's brilliant. She's absolutely brilliant and fully dependent. Uh, independent. So, let's see what she got up to last week. She's done very well for herself. At 18 months old, Talamba is developing into a fine huntress. The young princess brought down a young kudu of an oppressive size. She wasted no time reveling in her spoils. But as the sun set, she was driven by the need to secure her meal. Straining and determined, she attempted to secure the carcass on a tree nearby. Belly full and tired, Tulumba clambered down to rest, hoping that she had done well enough to secure her meal for later. Now, you have to be impressed. She's 18 months old. She has got this, it's not a small kudu. Compared to her size, I know a lot of it was eaten, but she managed to drag that and hoist it into that tree. That's impressive. And it's just, like I said, it's a year, 18 months old, and even two months ago, she was killing Impala. It's, it's incredible how far a leopard can go compared to a young lioness, for example, where she's so dependent on the pride to get to adulthood and to raise cubs and all that. While leopards, it's like, have fun, you're on your own. I suppose I do, do know some humans like that, that just can be very independent at a very young age. But leopards, she's done us proud and she is just, one of our favorite characters, and I'm sure she is a favorite character, a lot of you who have watched her from a cub. I unfortunately did not see her as a cub. I have seen a lot of past footage of her growing up, and it's been very, it's a huge pr privilege to be able to see her now as a full grown adult. Now let's see how her future plays out. It's great to see. We're still looking for these spotted cats. Hopefully Tulumbo might show herself. But while we do that, let's go back to James at the hyena den. Righty, we're back here. Just before I tell you who these are and what's going on, just listen. Sounds like there's a Franklin being murdered. I don't think it's particularly... I doubt it's something big that's doing the killing. Because the hyenas have not shown any interest except for the little ones. The little ones have shown interest. There's a snake or something like that. I'm not going to go blundering through there to try and find out. Could have been a... African hawk eagle or another bird of prey. Anyway, these are ribbons cubs, as far as I can make out. I haven't seen them for a long time, but they're the smallest cubs. And when we got here, Pretty was here, 
as well. So we went back to the old den, or not the old den, but the den we started at, came back here, and these two are out with an adult who we think was pretty, and she's just moved off. And then one of them went up to June, who was still here, and tried to suckle off her. Or perhaps didn't try and suckle. You know what? I think I've misinterpreted what they were trying to do. I think they were just greeting her. You know, she kind of did that roll onto the back and allowed access to her genitals, which is, of course, the way that hyenas find it most appropriate to, um, well, greet each other. That hyena is doing its best impression of Winnie the Pooh. And so I will have to take an illegal photograph of it. I have no one minds. Dex, you're a new viewer and you're wondering how they make these dens. They actually don't have a great deal to do with the construction. The youngsters do modify them, but they are artfark holes. So they are the holes that Artfark made in the dens in order to access the termites, and then they modify them. There is something going on down there. I can now hear Impala alarm calling. Faith, if Rusty is anywhere near, tell him something going on on Ingwe Alley Weaver's Nest, somewhere between the two. I don't think Rustles has had a particularly easy time of it today. Aren't they cute? These things are just wonderful. I don't know where their mother is. She was here, of course, when we got here. I just love that Pooh Bear look. A lot of you saying how super cute this is. It is absolutely. We're now being charged, uh, Craig. Mm hmm. Now, I was talking about Plonk's precociousness and how precocious he is around the vehicles. And I think you'll find, I mean, all young hyenas are interested in cars like this one is, but they they lose that, as I said. They also differ in how confident they are. So if I start the engine now, these things will disappear down into the car, into the hole. But if you start the engine around Plonk these days, he doesn't. He's not worried about that sound. I'm hoping to see young Plonky in the next 50 minutes or so. I haven't seen him for a very long time. All right, I believe that Pajamas has taken off those disturbing black gloves that she was wearing, and I think she's probably going to do a diagram this time round. I have hung up my black gloves. I haven't actually. I've thrown them away. And the scrub here has been sent back to nature to be returned to the stomach of whichever animal decides to eat it. So we've moved on to the slightly less stomach turning, quite literally in the scrub here's case, stomach turning part of our anatomy lesson. Now we see all sorts of different animals out on safari, one of which, of course, is the magnificent elephants. And you can imagine that their entire body is structured not just to be able to support their weight, but to be able to manage in different ways in dealing with being an animal that size. So first of all, we're going to have a quick look at the clip that we have. And what I want you to focus on while we're watching, I remember this was beautiful big elephant bull in Kenya, one that actually was so special he was collared. I want you to look at the way that the feet move, the trunk moves now as it's wrapping around the grass. Look at the flexibility of movement within it and the way in which they are able to maneuver their trunk backwards and forwards. And of course, 
as you most of you know and I'm probably going to leave that diagram out the way in which the elephant's ears used to cool it down <laughs> look at that look at the way the trunk's being used to drink water while swimming so even <laughs> though possibly tasting it and then of course we have the flare as well which just picks up on those heat patterns around the elephant's ears and in this case the elephant not actually giving up giving off an enormous amount of a heat okay so from there what I want to show you is first of all the way in which an elephant trunk works because an elephant trunk is a truly amazing thing it's a muscular hydrostat what that means is that there are no bones we always talk about the fact that there are no bones within an elephant's trunk but in that case how does it work it works in just the way that your same way that your tongue does so a muscular hydrostat is basically supported by the solidness of the of the fluid of the essentially water with stuff diluted in it so as you know water is pretty much incompressible you can't compress water so that basic principle is what governs the way that an elephant trunk moves or the way that it, it moves and the strength that it has. That means that it has to stay the same volume. So if you stretch out your tongue, it extends but it becomes narrower in diameter. I'm not doing it again. <laughs> I caught you. I was going to go very quickly there. If you flatten your tongue and pull it into your mouth, it becomes wider. So it has to stay exactly the same volume. Now from there, we always talk about just how many muscles an elephant trunk has. Well, I've done my best attempt at an oversimplified drawing of an elephant's trunk, which is over there. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a look, a closer look at it. And I'm going to show you the relevant parts of it using my special stick. So these cross hatchings here represent the different layers of muscle. Now it's an oversimplification because most of an elephant's muscles are radial muscles, but the top layer here is perpendicular muscle fibers. So this is the top layer over here. Then below that there are several sort of crossed muscles so that they go sort of across the trunk and allow it a large amount of sideways and twisting motion. And then within the trunk as well, there are also, particularly around, this is where, this is the two tubes of the nostril. They are basically perpendicular to the nostril itself. So there you go. That is what a, an elephant's trunk looks like. And then the parallel muscles obviously going across on top as well. And what that does is it allows a huge amount of movement from within the elephant's trunk. So it stretches forward and becomes thinner, it pulls back, it can turn in a way that our, my arm can't demonstrate because I'm, I've got bones in my arm, so you know I'm, I'm restricted by where my joints are, but it can twist right around. And that ultimately gives the elephant the ability to not only pull down a branch, but to pick up something as tiny as a matchstick, say. Not that they would want to pick up a matchstick, but a matchstick if they wanted to. So it creates this unbelievably flexible extra limb that must be so pleasant to have. And an extra limb for them. Of course, they, they walk on four legs, so they don't have hands. But that also allows them to drink without having to bend down to get to the water, which would make them very vulnerable. And at the same time, at the same time, it would also allow the elephant to move food to its mouth rather than the other way around. Joy wants to know if all muscles are hydrostats. I mean, in the sense that they're made up, uh, every bodily organ, we're, we're mostly water. So we're not really all that compressible. In, and so yes, in a sense, but it specifically refers to a combination of different structures, almost like an organ, that combine together to make a functional unit. Does that make sense? So a muscle on its own is not a functional unit. A muscle of, say, biceps combined with triceps that levers an arm, that makes a functional unit. In the same way that the the trunk is made up of all of these muscle fibers and depending on how you count the different muscles you know they say anything from 50,000 to 100,000 different muscles in an elephant's trunk those are all working together for one specific purpose I have one other 
quickly diagram that I want to show you of a cross section of an elephant's trunk. So I'm just going to switch the diagram round quickly. So you have a look at those pretty skulls while, while I do that. And I'll switch it round. This is Faith's favourite. Well, I think it's her favourite. I like to think it's her favourite. This is Faith's favourite. It's his, um, she calls it the the, dread, the dreadlocked um, the dreadlocked. What did you call it? Alien, the rusta alien. <laughs> so this is a cross section of an elephant's muscles. So you've got the sort of or the trunk. So these are the nostrils here, and the perpendicular muscles and the perpendicular muscle fibers running all the way along. This is the top part, this is the bottom part, and then blood vessels as well, of course, because the muscle fibers have to be, and the nerves and everything like that, have to be supply, supplied with the vital, whether it's uh, to oxygenate them or whatever it happens to be, they need to be supplied with those substances. And then radial muscle fibers that radiate out and allow a lot of that twisting motion that we were talking about. Now I've had great fun drawing diagrams recently. I cannot draw anything but I can copy and I can combine ideas which is essentially what I've been doing over the entire weekend because well, who needs a weekend? So that is the way in which an elephant trunk works. Now the next section that of course we would love to talk about but First, we're going to wait to answer Francesca. Francesca's question. That's a really good one. Francesca wants to know, you know, how does short trunk cope without a proper trunk? Now, short trunk's missing about, I would say, a quarter of the end part of her trunk. I suppose it depends on how compressed or expanded it is, but I'd say it's about a quarter, give or take, in volume. So she's missing those incredibly flexible and very dexterous finger-like protrusions at the end. However, if you watch her, she's learned to use it almost as efficiently and she can twist it. She's still got that range of motion and she can pluck things. It's not as neatly done as it is for other elephants and she can also use it to drink. So her nostril openings are not blocked. She can still draw water up into the trunk and then transfer it to her mouth. So there's, I mean, short trunk is, is pretty well adapted. However, I do think there's a chance that in the beginning, whenever she had that, whenever she got that injury, whether it was from a snare or possibly a crocodile, whenever it happened, I think that's how she got split away from the rest of her herd. I don't think she was able to keep up. I don't know if she was stuck for a while. Perhaps she was injured and ill. And eventually, I suspect, I will never know, I suspect her herd left her and moved on and maybe a younger sister stayed with her because I'm not sure that the eldest female with her is her daughter. I think there might be some other familial connection there. And then of course she went on to have the young male and the young female. Sorry, I saw movement in the tree outside. Um, Darby, can you zoom in on that marula tree? What is in that tree? Is that a, no, the marula tree. The de no, the live one, sorry. It's that one there. What is in that tree? It looked... I thought for one second, but I think it's because I have leopards on the brain. I thought I saw a leopard. But that would surely be impossible. In that tree. No, I'm imagining things, aren't I? No, look, there was definitely movement. But there's no leopard. Sorry. All right, everybody, nobody panic. I'm going to change diagrams quickly. Give me one second. Well done, Darby. I'm going to change your diagram for one moment and I'm going to show you what an elephant's foot, no I'm not, looks like because everything's fallen down. We've, we have a very advanced setup here. Okay, so I can't put it vertically because otherwise it would not fit. So we've got an elephant's foot lying on its side and I just wanted to show you a proper diagrammatic example of what we often talk about and unfortunately I've messed up the alignment of everything so now it's all showing the borders but they're, they're the little bones of the foot the way that an elephant's foot is structured allows it to rest upon that fatty cushion 
So an elephant actually does walk on its tiptoes. We tell you this all the time, but I just thought I'd give you a little diagrammatic example of exactly how that works and the way in which their feet are adapted to bear the weight. It allows the toes to spread out and most of the weight to actually be borne and um, cushioned by that giant piece of fatty connective tissue, which is essentially what that is. It's a fatty connective cushion. Now there you go. Several several diagrams on elephants. There's another one on elephant ears, but I think we're going to leave that one out because otherwise it's a, a vast amount of information to actually take in. I think probably a little bit too much. So whenever you see an elephant walking along, if you see them spreading out their weight and the way that their feet expand to cushion their weight, you'll be able to picture exactly the way in which their bones and their skeleton is adapted to do that. And when you see them feed, you'll be able to think about the trunk. I find this stuff absolutely fascinating. Well, I didn't see a leopard climbing into the tree as much as I really had hoped that I had. And Rusty's also really hoping to spot some spots. Let's see whether or not he's any closer. James and he mentioned that he had he could have in the blah. Listen out. Right. Hello, everybody. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened to Rustles or what happened to his audio. We are just sitting here with our youngsters, enjoying their company, thinking about going to check the other den and see if the older ones are out. But this is just so very appealing that I'm finding it difficult to tear my eyes away. So I think if it's all the same to you, we'll just sit around here for a little while. Everything's gone quiet where the animals were alarm calling. And now the typical game of eat stick is playing out. What I should have been doing, of course, while you weren't here, is trying to sex these cubs, which I don't think we've done yet. Oh, very sweet little things. Oh, look at this poo bear. Ah, right, well, one has got its equipment out and is going to chew on it for a while. That's fascinating. My goodness. That looks deeply painful. <laughs> I mean, there's really not much to say about that, is there? Not much that isn't going to cause some form of offence. I think I'll just be quiet, if you don't mind. Righty, now I told you that the other characters I had for the week were the Evoker male, seen by Lee, and the Inkuhuma cubs, or at least Inkuhuma pride, seen by Corley and Jamie. And, of course, when we saw them, we didn't realize that there had been a great trauma playing out down south. I'll tell you a little bit more about that after you've had a look at the Inkuhuma Pride. Various members of the Inkuhuma Pride appeared not long after the evoker male disappeared. The tatty-eared youngster called into the night. Her calls not territorial, but rather seeking contact with a missing member. A little while later, we found out why. Her mother, the oldest lioness of the pride, known as Nana, had breathed her last. 
The six visitors looked fat and well fed, and only subsequently did we find out that they had been feeding on a hippo far to the south, where a conflict eventually resulted in the old lioness's death. It is frustrating that we are unable to read the pride's emotional or hormonal state from their expressionless faces. Were they in mourning at the loss of one of their number? Had they experienced a traumatic conflict? Were they just moving on from another one of the inevitable upheavals of being a lion in Africa? Whatever the case, the Unkahuma pride lives to fight another day albeit without their oldest, most experienced mother and huntress. So some very sad news, of course, reached us that that Nana had died. And I, I'm constantly reminded at a point like this where people try and euphemize that by saying she passed away, she was taken, she died. And unfortunately for her, I don't think the death was particularly pleasant, not that it ever is pleasant, but we subsequently have found out that there was a hippo carcass at Londolozi, up in the northern parts of Londolozi, and there was some conflict there. I don't know which prides arrived and took part in the conflict. One can only imagine it must have been the Styx Pride, perhaps, uh, with conflicting with the... Uh, Nkuhumas, possibly even the Birmingham boys came in there. I don't know what happened, but apparently Nana was injured. Possibly she was defending her youngsters, a uh, tatty-eared lioness, but most likely her son. Maybe she was trying to defend them when they came across either the Evokers or the Birminghams, because, of course, he is of an age that uh, he would be threatened by them. Anyway, whatever happened, we don't know. She was injured very badly. And then she went off to a dam not far away, apparently on Elephant Plains, where she either succumbed to her injuries and died there, or she was killed by elephants. So elephants pitched up and apparently tossed her around. But we don't know if she was dead at that stage or if she had died already. So, yes, a tragic, horrible story. All of our characters' deaths are tragic and horrible, but at the same time, she was an old lioness, and I can't reiterate enough how successful she was as a lioness and how her legacy, uh, certainly her genetic legacy, lives on. And there can be no greater description of an animal's success than the extent of their genetic legacy, well, certainly from a biological point of view anyway. So, that's what's happened to the Unkuhumas. They will now have... Of course, there's no alpha female in a pride, uh, but she did seem to lead them on the hunt. And so, I guess they'll have to find another lead huntress. Chris, I'm not entirely clear how old she was when she died. I will just have a quick look. I think she was about 12. Um, just give me one second, I'll tell you exactly now. Well, I don't think we know exactly, exactly, but I can give you an estimate. Give me one second here. One second, I am still looking. It will not take long. No, it won't take long. Here we go. It comes. I hope it won't take long. Our hyenas have disappeared. We still have June over there for some reason. I'm not really sure why June was over there as opposed to at the other den. Just give me a few more seconds, everybody. I'm just waiting for this beastly document to load. Um, if anybody else... Oh, here we go. Here we go. Don't worry. She was born sometime... In July 20... What? No, that was her first litter. Date of birth, 2007 or 2008. So she could have been as old as 12. She could have been as young as just over 10. I think she was older than 10. I would have said that her age was around about 12. That's not bad for a lioness. It really isn't. That's pretty, pretty good. They can live older than that, sure. But the life of conflict that they lead out here, it's unusual for them to get older than that. So... A sad story, and we must try and put some sort of positive spin on it, of course. And the old cliché of living and dying by the sword really does apply here, because while we feel sorry for this lioness that has succumbed either to injuries or been killed by elephants, 
It does not forget the trauma she has created for, well, her prey and also for other predators, you know. Imagine the terror of little leopards coming across that lioness or hyena cubs coming across that lioness. So out here, the old cliché of living and dying by not so much the sword but the claw and the canine really does apply. And so, yes, it's always sad when a character dies, but unfortunately, there is really no way around it. We are going to move now towards the other den and see if anything's going on over there. The last thing I wanted to say about that death is that, of course, death is a biological inevitability. There is no organism in the world that has survived forever, and certainly no animal has survived for particularly long in comparison with some plants, but all of them, even the Greenland shark, is going to die eventually. Let's go over to Rusty now, who I don't think has ever seen a Greenland shark. I apologise about earlier. I got cut off halfway through. It's just the gremlins are attacking from all sides. But I was saying James got hold of us. I don't know how much of that you heard on the radio, saying you could hear alarm calls from the hyena den of Impala and also of Spurfowl and the Franklin, the Crested Franklin's going. And we're getting closer and closer to the area. But it also is that time of the evening where these birds do enunciate themselves a bit over the bed do go over the top when doing so. But I can't hear any more Impala, but I can still hear the spur fowl, the Chris of Franklin. Sorry. So we're just gonna stop here for a second and see if it materializes. Listen. So we believe it might be Tundi around here, but Shall we see what she's been up to in this last week? The Queen of Juma spent a lazy day digesting an impala meal. As the afternoon wore on, Tanya returned to eat. She made it through most of the impala before the hyenas moved in. As the Queen created distance between herself and the scavengers, they made quick work of the leftovers. That was such an epic moment that I spent with Tandy that that it was about, well, we spent, what, about maybe an hour with her, an hour and a half. But that's a great thing about being here is that you can do that. We have no rush to be anywhere. So we can just, once we find a leopard and particularly Tandy, you can just sit and wait it out. And she was full, hey, full. Like, <laughs> she looked like she ate two Imhala. But it was quite funny to watch it. I was like, I was staring at this carcass. I was like, there's not actually a lot to it. The half the body was missing. I was like, okay, that's pretty epic. And then found out that she actually stored the hind legs up in the tree. And I think it's like, a, I think she's learned over the year, many, many years. She's been hunting that store what, the heavier piece on the ground, eat as much as possible during the day. Because by the time the evening comes, the hyenas are gonna move in. But keep that one piece of meat in the tree, just in case where it's out of reach of everybody else. So I think she got lucky and the hyenas moved in. It was just out the sides, out of nowhere. Just, I actually heard bushes moving. And then she saw it, moved off, and the hyenas moved in. Uh, yeah. But yeah, she is a very successful hunter, but not all the time. <laughs> we have had a few misses and a few close calls. So. Let's go take a look at one of the times she didn't quite get what she wanted for breakfast. Another day dawned in Juma and the queen emerged from the thickets. Hungry and on a mission after losing her kill to hyenas and failing to scavenge her daughter's critical. She set her sights on a daikon, inging forward with great stealth. She waited for the right moment and pounced, but the diker was quick off the mark. The grumpy queen slunk away into the thickets to reevaluate her breakfast options. So yes, you will see that she may be the queen of Juma, but she has to work hard for her meal. Now, 
Those birds have stopped alarming. So whatever did come through here has moved off all these uh, Franklin have given us a little bit of false hope. So I'm going to do a loop around, just I'm going to go back the way we came. It's either whatever it was here, if it was a leopard, it's either gone up to Voitela Dam, to the dam cam area, just to have a drink of water there, or gone down to twin dams. Uh, uh, my bet is down to twin dams. So we're going to head there. We're going to head there and see, we'll see if we can pick it up. Okay, while we do that, let's go back to Jamie in the tent. Well, we're going off on a completely different tack now. We're still talking about anatomy, but in terms of animals that we're likely to see, we're going to talk about one that we're pretty unlikely to see. So the guys are searching for spots in all shapes and forms. And what I want to talk about next is the anatomy of a cheetah. And particularly with regards to their spine and the design of their spine. So first what we're going to do is we're going to watch some of the cheetah hunts that we've witnessed in the Maasai Mara. So we're just going to have a look at those quickly. Now this is a cheetah just jogging through a rainy, rainy Mara landscape. There, a little bit of increase of speed and then deciding it's not worth the energy expenditure as it runs along. And next, we're of course going to look at the musketeers. Now, this was a hunt with Scott. Watch the way that the cheetah's back feet move and the speed with which the spine expands and contracts because that's going to be very, very important as it catches up with an antelope that is really known for being phenomenally quick. It is absolutely astounding and hop! It's awesome. It is absolutely awesome. Now, the way that a cheetah is adapted to be able to run so much faster than anything else out here, fastest land mammal, by a fair amount has to do with several different factors, one of which of course is the semi non retractable claws which give it traction that those large back feet compared to its front feet typically the back feet of most cats are smaller than the front feet but in cheetah they are actually quite large and quite round to allow for a huge amount of traction but the most important part of a cheetah's anatomical design is its spine so I've drawn you a diagram over there and we're just going to have a look at the way in which and I've obviously drawn clearly in red compared to a zebra the way in which a cheetah's spine moves so look at the curve as it's running and it obviously happens really really quickly look at the curve there and then look at the back feet over there you can see the way that the back feet actually can move in front of the front feet almost below the shoulder blade I didn't draw its feet because I can't draw feet and oh, its back feet fall here and its front foot goes behind then as it launches itself and stretches outward it can lift its back legs up right up high and the spine actually bends in uh, the opposite way now compare that to the shape of a zebra spine as it runs so if you have a look there obviously very oversimplified drawing you can see how it can barely curve upwards meaning that the back foot and the front foot are sort of falling into the same place the back foot doesn't extend all the way across to underneath its shoulder then as it stretches out the same thing it cannot lift its legs right up it cannot stretch its front legs right out in front of it so that spine is actually relatively immovable and all of that results in the cheetah's phenomenal capacity for speed. So its spine allows it to take these massive, massive strides. And all it is, is loosely articulated vertebra. So it's just that. It's that simple. Loosely articulated vertebra, you know that especially with the with arching one's back, so arching your back, you know that the spinal processes limit exactly where your spine, how far your spine can bend back, except in those exceptional people who are contortionists. The back is pretty limited with exactly how far back it can bend. Most of that is because it's held in place by muscles and tendons, which sort of lock it in place. But there's a limit to how flexible it is, where with a cheetah, they are just that much looser as they run. So those that back arches up, 
and allows it to curve in that way. Obviously, it happens so quickly when you're watching them run that it's actually quite difficult to see it happen. But you can see how they, that spine makes an enormous difference in the attaining that level of speed, that extra little level. And typically they abandon hunts not because they overheat, but it's just not worth the energy consumption. We know with Naratoy, she actually ended up having to be put down due to brain damage because she hadn't got enough food. And her sugar levels, her blood sugar levels had just dropped so low that ultimately she didn't manage to keep her brain fed, essentially. That's the oversimplification. They actually don't, it's not because they overheat. They cannot expend that much energy contracting and expanding those muscles to create that burst of speed. Oh, where was I going with that thought? Why was I saying that? It's obviously very different for animals designed for stamina. What was I going to say about that? Oh, where they do overheat, typically, and they've done a study on this, is when they're really stressed out about losing their prey. That is when they start to really build up body heat and their body temperature actually lifts up. They don't overheat necessarily, but that's where you see the greatest spike in their body temperature, especially when confronted with something like a hyena or a lion, even more stressful for them. And that's when you get that fight or flight response, which of course we've talked about previously on Safari Lives. So there you go, a comparison with something like a zebra, which is also very, very fast, but not quite as fast as a cheetah. Now, hopefully, as the evening gets a little bit dimmer, the two vehicles out and about are driving or not driving quite as fast as a cheetah might run. Let's go and see if James is speeding along. Yes, I am feeling my way along in the dark. We've left the hyenas because it was just the one left there. Only June lying there asleep and I thought we'd just have a quick look around for the last 20 minutes or so and see if we can't find something there. Something by way of spotted cat perhaps, if we're there lucky. No, there's no track here. This is a roundabout where I heard those Franklins screaming at each other. Unsurprising there, that's where the luck's gone over the last few weeks, or a few days, sorry. Anyhow, I must say I would like to see a bit more of the lions sometime soon. But they seem to be knocking about always, not quite a tumour. All right, I did mention that uh, the evokers or one evoker came to visit us, came to see Lee and um, to introduce himself one morning. Looked a little bit riled up, a little bit kind of uh, not particularly happy with life. So let's go and have a look at him. This week we had a visit from the grumpiest member of the evoker coalition. The Mohawk male, as is his moniker, was on edge, looking riled. It's possible he had just been in a conflict with the Unkahumas and other lions at a hippo carcass to the south, the result of which was to be another wilderness tragedy. While it's wild conjecture, it is possible that he had a difference of opinion with Nana about her son. So I don't know why he was so riled up. Uh, I, look, he didn't look very riled up in that clip, but Lee just said that he was, he was just not happy. And he isn't very happy around cars. We know that, that Mohawk male is not particularly pleased to ever be around cars. But it is entirely possible that he had had some form of conflict around that hippo carcass. That hippo carcass and being on northern Londolosi is pretty much on the boundary between the Evokers and the Birmingham boys. And I wonder if there wasn't a whole big upheaval there. But I'm not sure, and the Londo's guys can't tell me exactly what's going on because there are a whole lot of lions there that they didn't recognize. And so it's quite possibly the Inkahumas. So I'm not really sure why he should have been so irritated. He may have had something to do with Nana's death. Uh, I don't know. Nobody knows. These lions, as we've said before, uh, don't subscribe to our sort of human sensibilities, if you like. 
uh, what's acceptable behavior and what isn't. They just behave in any way they see fit. I'm hoping that they'll spend a bit more time here. I'm also, uh, I'm thoroughly irritated that by this stage we still haven't seen any of their offspring, which is deeply irritating because it's round about time, I think, that we did have some Avoca cubs and that they were denned here on Juma and then we spent extended periods with them as we did with these youngsters in 2016. Anyway, that's my fervent wish for the winter. Let's go back across to Jamie and find out just how it is that those Avoca boys are able to make such a loud noise. That's something that fascinates all of us. And whenever we're sitting with a male lion or even the female lions at night, we're always sort of saying, they could roar any moment they're going to roar. Maybe they're going to roar, please roar. Often we're saying, please roar, please roar to ourselves because it is such a spectacular experience. So have a look at this, whoopsie daisy. There we go. Have a look at the evokers roaring and watch the way that their bodies move. I almost don't want to talk over this, actually, so I won't. It's a really, really spectacular sound, but any singer will tell you that producing something like that must have a tremendous effect on one's vocal cords. So just imagine, they produce a sound around about 114 decibels or so. That can be heard up to eight kilometers away, possibly even more by the human ear, ear, human ear let alone by another lion. Now you can imagine it, the impact and you get singers who through various vocal exercises they look after their voice very very carefully but even then they run the risk of actually getting nodes or nodules on their vocal flaps. So how does a lion actually produce such a massive sound without causing any damage? And I've drawn a diagram so that I can explain the secret of it to you. But the issue here is that I had to put it not quite in the way that it really, that I really wanted to position it. It's meant to be structured in a different way. So the air comes through here. This is a cross section of the vocal box or the larynx. And these folds here are the ones responsible for the sound. And this tissue over here is muscle tissue. But what's most important is the content of or the way in which these vocal folds are structured and they have a very very high elasticity much higher than that of a human being lots and lots of elastic tissue connective tissue as well as a little bit of fatty tissue in there as well which enables the lion to make that massive sound without causing damage but what researchers have determined is that the differences within a, a lion's vocal roar are caused by its age and the structure of these vocal folds. So that's why a lioness sounds different to a young male and an adult male sounds different to a young female and so on. And they of course can each pick up on the individual sounds. Yes. There you go. Choi wants to know if they're designed differently to make a different vocal sounds possible. Yes, they are. The most important point is that elasticity there, but they're also shaped slightly differently in order to... I was going to draw uh, the larynx of a cat just as a demonstration, as a contrast, but honestly, I ran out of time. So you'll have to just take my word for it that they are slightly differently shaped, but it also has to do with the structure within the tissue itself not just the shape of the vocal folds. There's a second aspect to a lion's roar 
and this is the hyoid apparatus. So the larynx in a lion, like a human being, actually sits very low down in their neck. Now in humans, they theorize that the reason it's low down in our necks is so that we can produce quite a vast array of different vocalizations, but in lions, it allows a much greater resonating capacity. So this actually connects, This is, it's a funny orientation, this is the back of the lion here, this is its bottom jaw, so imagine it's sort of facing downwards, and then this is its throat over here. And this connects it to the bone, but it's very, very loosely structured and very thin when compared to something like a non-roaring cat, where it's much more angular and the voice box sits around about here, and the connections are much tighter, so there's much less flexibility. It's a very, very loose hyoid. And as a result, there's actually a muscle that connects right down to the diaphragm, which pulls that voice box down, opens it up, and creates a massive resonating cavity which allows the lion to produce that sound. So they do have a capacity, and you saw the muscle tissue that I drew in on the vocal folds. That muscle tissue can also expand and contract in just the same way that we do. We obviously have a greater capacity to produce different vocalizations. We can make different sounds, but they can expand and contract to change the shape of those vocal folds. But when they're really roaring, when they're going into it, those muscles set, hold those, hold those flaps in place, and the air pushes through and causes that vibration, which ultimately causes the roar. And then those last few uh, 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 sounds at the end, sorry, that sounds terrible, but you know what I mean. The end part of the roar, just brief, expulsions of air and you can actually see their diaphragm contracting with each smooth muscle of course so it is a largely involuntary they're voluntarily calling but the process is involuntary where you've got smooth muscle you've got an involuntary process happening whether it's doing that and maintaining your, the movement of your diaphragm or if it is for all the diaphragms not the greatest example or if, for example, it is dilating or constricting the blood vessels like it might for an elephant's ear if it was cold or it was hot. And this evening, I think it's safe to say that it is cold for all concerned, most importantly, the people driving about. Let's see whether Rusty has any update on his last-minute leopard. Well, I would love to give you good news about any of the leopards around here, but you know, we've got not much movement at the moment. But I just don't want this evening to end because you know they're here. And I've always worked on this philosophy, or uh, let's say in the last 10 years. It's not, it's very hard to find leopard. And it's not, leopards let them, let themselves be seen. It's not we see them, it's like they let us see them. They, it's thick, thick bush here. It's incredible how the amount of times we do get to see these leopard and how often we get to see them. Just, they are very shy, sly creatures. And I think it's just when they want to be seen. So yes. <laughs> but while we're talking about leopards still, let's look at what Kuchava has been up to the last week. The Queen's oldest daughter, Kuchava, was a picture of serenity and royalty. Belaying her name, which means scared, she boldly surveyed the surroundings, hoping for the sight of a meal or perhaps quite simply enjoying the evening breeze. After a significant period of not much, the older princess descended the mound. She took a brief stroll, making sure she was leaving her scent behind before settling on a log for the evening. Oh, she is a beauty, hey? and that's what I was hoping for when you see her like laying out on a log. That's what we expect, or how we expect to see all leopards, either a log or a termite mound. Isn't it just your iconic leopard pose? Or just hanging over a tree. But I just stopped up here because I did hear another alarm call, but of Impala. 
but now with this full rutting season going on, it's quite difficult to see if it's an alarm call or actual impala rutting. I think it's a false alarm. Well, let's go back to Jamie and see how her evening's going. You never know, the writing season can be terribly deceptive and of course uh, cats do walk so silently which because we're <laughs> rapidly approaching the end and I spent so long cutting up that scrub hair we're sort of rushing our way through the end parts of what I'm trying to tell you about animal anatomy. We're talking about the silence of the big cats and I'm going to skip the clip or at least I'm not going to show you the clip right now. We're going to have a look first at the diagram of the structure of a leopard or a lion's paw. So if you have a look at it now just very quickly you'll see the way in which they walk. This here is the front paw. So this is the wrist joint. The wrist joint works in exactly the same way as our wrist joints do and then these extended carpals and these phalanges over here meaning that they only walk on the front part of what would be their hands wait go away stick the front part of what would uh, would be our hands but are their paws and that allows them with this cushioning over here of the bottom part of the pad allows them to walk quietly and then this here, I didn't draw the claw in because it was all getting a bit crowded in there. But that there is the really powerful claw that they use when they are taking something on. When they're taking something down and it comes out and it actually hooks onto their prey. So those beautiful paws really, really designed perfectly for exactly what they are intended to do and the same applies for dogs as well hyenas anything with a paw structure so the other thing to mention just really quickly remember that in your hands in your fingers there are no muscles you don't have muscles here otherwise you'd feel them contracting you have muscles here but not muscles here what we have are tendons running down the digits. Now that exact thing is seen in the structure of a paw as well. So that basically is the way, what I want to show you is the way in which lions and leopards are actually able to retract or extend their claws. Now we talk about retracting their claws as if it's an active verb, but it's actually a passive thing. So what they do, and I'm, I'm going to do this for sake of expediency, is I'm just going to hold up the diagram because it's just easier. So what they do is this, this position here is actually the natural resting position and this here is a long tendon that holds that claw up in place. And the only way that that can actually be pulled down is with some muscular force. And these tendons here hook down onto the bottom of the claw so that when the claw is extended the muscles contract further up in the paw causing the claw to actually stretch out and expand and hook downwards pulling this tendon here completely taut so it gets stretched right down so there you go I just wanted to explain that to you because we always talk about retracting their claws as if they have to visibly think about it or actively do it but that's not how it works at all it's a resting position just in the same way that when bats hang upside down their resting position is with their feet locked closed there's a lot of examples of that in nature. Giraffes' heads held up in their resting position by a massive, massive tendon or collection of tendons that hold it upright and they actually have to contract their muscles to bring it down. How cool is that? So that gentle, soft padding of the paw, that's what I see. I know that's ridiculous, but whenever I watch a leopard or a lion walk down the road, at least one part of my brain is thinking about the way that they move. Now, obviously, I've, sent, I've seen many an animal walk down the road, both the roads of Juma and the roads of the Masai Mara, a beautiful place that has given us many truly extraordinary experiences.
a truly, truly spectacular place. And for now, a last update from the Masai Mara, for now at least, because it has treated us to so many extraordinary sightings. And of course, we have become so attached to the different animals. And we were so excited to show you that little catch up that we actually have extended the drive ever so slightly. But that does bring us to the end. Oh, moth of our safari lives for this week. I hope that most of you enjoyed it. I know that dissections are not everybody's cup of tea and hopefully you enjoyed a nice cup of tea instead of that, if that is the case. I find animal anatomy absolutely fascinating and I'm sure that all of most of you do as well. I think it's part and parcel of understanding the way in which animals interact with each other and the way in which their bodies are designed to be able to do certain things. And of course, to not be able to do certain things as well. And there's some things that we didn't even get to touch on, the strength of a hyena's jaws, but I did feel that we've spoken about that so often that we actually, it wasn't necessary for us to go back into that once again. So thank you all for your strong stomachs. Thank you for sitting through that and hopefully you enjoyed a little bit of an in-depth look into the animals that we know and love because I certainly enjoyed it. That brings us to the end of Safari Lives. I hope you've had fun and thank you as always for your questions, comments and participation. We'll see you then. Thank you.